The Australian Children's Television Foundation, ACME, and the Australian National Maritime Museum respectfully acknowledge the custodians of the lands on which we are joining you today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We honour their continuing cultures and connection to the lands, seas and skies and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples throughout Australia. Teachers, please share your students' responses and questions in the Zoom chat throughout the workshop. Let's start by sharing the names of the traditional custodians of the lands on which you are joining us today. My family are explorers. We have been for generations. While others look up to the stars, we know there are an infinite number of things that shine in the darkness below. There are things lurking in the seas that long ago vanished into myth. My family are the Nectins, and we explore the deep. Second Bridget, just lost track of time, sorry. Oh, thanks Gary. It does look like a lovely day for a swim out there. Uh, hi everyone. While we're waiting for Gary, take a look at where I am. Do you know this place? Does it look a bit familiar? That's right. I'm in the Aranex, the submarine used by the Necton family to explore the oceans. I wonder if Gary's nearly ready for us. I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, let's get going. Oh, fresh out there. Wonderful. Gary and I are so glad you're joining us today because we need your help on a mission. We want to learn all about the characters and underwater creatures from the television show, The Deep. I wonder, have you seen the television show, The Deep? Ooh, quite a few people saying they've seen it. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, if you haven't, The Deep is a CGI animated TV show, which means it's all made using animation software. When creating an animation, every single thing you see on screen was a decision made by the people who created the show. From the flow of seaweed in the ocean current, to the way a character walks, to the length of a monster's teeth, or the water reflecting off a tiny pebble on the ocean floor. When making a TV show, the creators often look to the real world for inspiration for their stories and characters. Then they use these ideas and their imagination to create amazing fantasy and sci-fi worlds for us to enjoy. Have you ever read a story or watched a TV show or a film that does that? Oh, that's a good question. I do love sci-fi shows. Oh, there's a few people saying that they have also watched some sci-fi and fantasy shows as well. Brilliant. Excellent. So Gary, today we have help from some of the experts who worked on and created The Deep. Uh, let's get producer Avril on the screen. Uh, Avril, are you there? Ah, great. Uh, could you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Hello, I'm Avril Stark, and I'm the creative driver of A Stark Production and also the producer of The Deep. My role on The Deep as the producer includes raising the finance for the show, um, to make the show so we can go into production and then once we're in production um, my key role is to bring together all the key creative uh, people involved in making the show these would include the director writers the art director storyboard artists and the composer and also bringing an animation studio on board to bring the show to life and in that process it's really important that all of these key creative people share the same vision, the same creative vision when they bring the show to life. Another important part of my role is to raise the finance, as I said, but it's also to make sure that the show stays on track in terms of schedule and very importantly, in terms of the budget and nothing runs over. That's a, a very key element of my uh, role in the deep. Avril, we're going to be exploring character and creature design. 
we love the characters and the deep Necton family, Aunt Fontaine, the dad Will, the mum Kiko, and of course we can't forget Jeffrey the fish. And there's Mad Madeline Hammerhead who makes a great antagonist along with her dad Captain Hammerhead. And then we have all the creatures as well, my favourites, uh, the Kraken and the monumental turtle, the gigantic turtle that gets mistaken for an island. Yeah, they're both really, really cool ones, aren't they? Uh, Avril, could you tell us how the team starts to design for a new character? When creating a new character, especially a new character from scratch, we look for things in that character that tell us a little bit about them. You know, what are their likes and dislikes? What, do that, what does that character want within the show? Um, what's their history? And how do they relate to the other characters in the show? And then after we've broken down all of those things, we look to their appearance. Involved in that process is usually the script editor um, who's leading the writing team, the lead writer of the show, the director, and of course myself, the producer. Oh, thank you so much, Avril, how cool. Uh, so how amazing that so many people are involved in the character design process. It sounds like collaboration is a really big part of making an animation. Absolutely, and I mean, especially when designing characters and creatures. And we're so lucky to have not only Avril, but James with us here today as well. And James is going to help answer some more of our questions. Uh, let me just check, James, are you there? Wonderful, I'll get you up on screen so you can introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, my name is James Brower and I'm the art director on the Deep Animated Series. In my role as art director, I'm responsible for the way the show looks on your screen, which involves supervising a team of designers to create all the props, vehicles, creatures, characters, and environments for every episode of the show. So cool. I mean, that sounds like such a fun job. Uh, thank you for sharing with us what you do, James. As the art director in the deep, could you tell us a bit more about the process of character design? Oh, good question. When designing a character, the first step in our process is to look at the information from the script and consult with the writers to better understand their intentions for the character. So things like where the character is from, what they do, what sort of environment they live in. Do they spend most of their time on land or underwater? Do they get lots of sun and exercise or do they spend most of their time indoors? If the character is from a real world location, we'll do as much research as we can to make sure we're representing their ethnicity and culture accurately. We'll also look at how the character behaves in the story and ask questions like, are they there for drama or comedy? And design the physicality of the character to suit. We'll often draw characters in action poses or typical situations to give us and the animators a better understanding of how they express themselves or react to a situation. So we start with these general details and then get more specific with each pass. We often go through several rough passes on a character before settling on a final design. We'll rough out various options for height, body shape, hairstyle, accessories like glasses or jewellery, and of course the character's costume. From there, once everyone agrees on a final design, we create a turnaround and model sheet, showing the character from a few angles, plus any particular details that need extra attention like unique mouth shapes or eye colours, and maybe some typical poses and expressions for the character. These are then sent to the modelling team, who create the 3D character model, and then the final textured model is ready to be animated. So cool. Wow, thanks James. Uh, designing characters sounds like a really long process, hey? Uh, how interesting is it to see that beautiful concept art that James and the team created for some of the characters from the deep? All the information on those drawings that you could see, the little annotations, the little scribbles of notes, that must be really helpful for everyone who's working on the animation. Uh, I'm not really familiar with concept art, Gary. I know what it looks like and how beautiful it is. Do you know much about concept art? Yeah, I know a little bit. Uh, concept art is a form of visual art used to convey an idea for use in film, animation and TV shows. So this is used in the development stage. So this is way before they get to the animation stage. Uh, the examples that James shared from the deep were created after the script was written, like James said, 
and they help to support the animators to build the characters into their animation software. Ah, thanks so much for explaining that, Gary. That's great. I do wonder though, where do the creators get their ideas for some of the creatures in the television show, The Deep? Shall we ask James? Up to. So James, uh, could you tell us where you get inspiration from? When we're designing creatures for The Deep, we firstly look to the natural world for inspiration. As fantastical as the creatures in the show might be, we always like to start with real world references to keep the stories a little bit grounded in reality. From there, it's all up to our imaginations to see how far we can push the designs while staying within the boundaries of the script. Hmm. Hey Bridget, hmm. did you know that much of the ocean lies unexplored and unexplained? So it's a really great place for us to use our imagination and think about what could lie deep beneath the surface. And that's exactly what James and his team has done. The team from The Deep have used their imagination to create lots of the stories and creatures for the TV show. Oh, and Megan from the Australian National Maritime Museum is going to help us with this next activity. She's an expert in ocean science. Uh, Megan, are you there? Everyone, I'm here and happy to help. Hi Megan, thanks for joining us. We're going to play a game. We're going to show some images of creatures from the deep TV show. And I want to know if they're real or not. Make sure you're playing along in the classroom too. This is how you can tell us your answers. And teachers, put the results in the chat for us as well. Let's start off with a practice. Hmm, okay. If you think that this creature is real, put your hands in the air. If you think this creature is made up and not real, you can touch your knees. And if you're not sure, you can just shrug like this. What do you think, Gary? Uh, I'm going to go shrug emoji with this one. I'm not sure. Mm. Megan, what's the answer? Oh, this is a good one to start off. This giant creature is not real. But what the creators of the Deep TV show have done is used a real life creature as inspiration. The creature is based on tardigrades and they're usually so tiny, they're only visible through a microscope. But in the deep, they're absolutely huge. Oh, thanks, Megan. Okay, let's look at our next creature. Whoa, what about this one? Uh, hands in the air if you think it's real, touch your knees if you think it's made up, and shrug if you don't know. Gary, what do you think? I'm confident. Megan, back me up here, right? It's real, yeah? <laughs> Well, kind of. It's another creature that is not totally real. In the deep TV show, they call it a sea unicorn, which doesn't exist, but it does have a lot of features that resemble a real creature called a narwhal. Now, unfortunately, in real life, narwhals don't have glittery horns. In fact, what we often think of as a horn is actually a very long tooth called a tusk. I didn't know tusks were long tooths. Oh, me neither. How interesting. Let's look at our next one. Hmm. Oh, I know this character. Hands in the air if you think this creature is real. Touch your knees if you think this creature is made up and shrug if you're not sure. Gary, what do you think? I'm going to go not, not real. Not real. Hmm. Megan, let us know. Um, this one is definitely real. Uh, this is, of course, Ant's pet Jeffrey, who is a yellow back basslet fish, a type of fish that can grow to up to about 13 centimetres long and is found off the coast of Queensland as well as other tropical areas of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Oh, amazing. That They're one's... still called basslets when they grow up? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm glad we've got one that's close to home though. So close to Queensland, that's awesome. All right, time for our last one. Whoa, take a look at that. Hands in the air if you think that it's real. Touch your knees if you think it's made up and shrug if you're not sure. Gary, what do you think? Gotta get one of these, right? I'm gonna go not real. Not real. Mm, Megan, let us know. All right, so well, this one is not real as well. In the deep, they call this a monumental and it's absolutely huge, enormous, ancient creature. But you can see 
just how tiny the submarine is in this image. It means that the creature is massive. But it does have a lot of physical features that resemble a real life creature. Can anyone guess what that creature might be? What do you think it looks like? I'm sure a lot of you probably said a turtle. That's right. Um, but in the deep, this is a lot bigger than any turtle that has ever lived. Currently, the largest turtle that scientists and paleontologists know about was only 4.6 metres long, four and a half metres long, and swam the seas during the time of the dinosaurs. Still pretty big though, right? Bridget? Yeah, absolutely. 4.6 metres. I don't think I'd want to run into a to a 4.6 metre turtle, even in the Aranex. I think that would be a bit scary. Well, thank you so much, Megan. That was really cool to learn a little bit, bit more about the creatures in the deep and how they were based on um, some real characters and maybe some things that were made up or changed a little bit. Can you stay online in case we have a few more questions for you? All right, sure thing. So we can see these creatures take inspiration from real sea creatures and then add changes, say size, or even add mythical elements so they can be entertaining and exciting in the animated world. Yeah, I think making tiny things big is a really great, great way to make a scary creature. I mean, imagine a cute little sea fire, of course, but then a giant seahorse would be really scary. Yeah, totally. Even like a little spider could be really huge and be super scary. Wait, hold on. There's something happening outside the window here. What? Gary, it looks like looks like a minotaur. Do you remember that creature from the deep? Yeah, but no, they're not found in this part of the ocean, I don't think. But you make a good point. It would be great to learn more about how the minotaur was designed, though. Have you seen the episode with that character? Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, hmm, it's one of my favourites. Hey, James, um, can you give us some more detail on the character design process? Using the minotaur as an example of the design process, we of course had the mythical creature with a bull's head and a man's body as a starting point. But our minotaur was trapped in an underwater maze, so we needed to look at a hybrid creature that could live and breathe underwater. The minotaur in our story lives on seagrass, so it made sense that some of our early references were manatees and dugongs, grazing mammals who just happened to look a bit like cows. Their features were fused with tails from sharks and other fish, because human legs just didn't seem right for our aquatic beast. After reviewing the rough designs with the production crew, it was decided that the Minotaur should have some more humanoid aspects, so more visual exploration was needed, eventually resulting in a unique creature with a bull's face, coral encrusted horns, a humanoid torso with gills for breathing underwater, and a shark's tail to complete the design. Cool, huh? It's pretty cool how they brought all the different parts of those different animals together like that. Yeah, it totally was. Um, oh, Gary, again, look, behind you, there is something definitely there. You see it, don't you? You can see it. Look, Bridget, I don't see anything, and I want to know about some more characters. Oh, I mean, you all saw it, didn't you? I think it was that fish. It's called, um, oh, what's it called? The walker. It's that beautiful, beautiful fish. Oh, the walker. I watched that episode the other day. I love the part when the walker first appeared. It looks so magical, huh? It'd be great to see one in real life, wouldn't it? Um, James, can you tell us more about how you designed the walkers? So let's now take a look at the walker's design process. The walker is a giant flying gurnard, which is a type of fish that has some very distinctive features. These include a single dorsal fin ray located on the fish's neck and very large pectoral fins. These fins have large back sections that look like wings and shorter forward sections that look like legs. In designing the walker, we basically had to decide between two options. Do we approach the design from a realistic angle or do we try something more fanciful? Our first pass was a more realistic interpretation based on the real world flying gurnard. After review, we decided something more mythical and awe-inspiring would work better for the story. So we changed our approach and created a lumbering fish that looked like it would have real weight and presence, complete with some mystical spiral patterns on its skin. 
while I was fleshing out the walker's design, I was actually inspired by the intriguing designs, physicality, and presence of the Kami from the movie Spirited Away and the Boar Tribe from Princess Mononoke. Oh, I love that they took inspiration from other animations as well. Gary, you must see that. Turn around right now. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. That looks like a dragon or a dinosaur or something. Okay, you weren't making it up, Bridget. Uh, but should I be worried? Um, no, no, no. I don't think so. I think it just wants to take a good look at us. Um, oh, I wonder if Megan knows anything about this. Um, Megan, are you still there? Yeah, wonderful. Could you give us a bit more information about that creature? I've been watching, and if I had to guess, I'd say this creature is based on something called a pleosaur. Now, I think in the deep they're called leviathans, but that's a television show and it's based off of mythical creatures like the Loch Ness Monster, but also a real prehistoric reptile called a pleosaur. While technically not dinosaurs, pleosaurs swam in the ocean at the same time as dinosaurs, and different species could grow between one and a half and 15 meters long. Oh, well, it seems to be gone now. I'll let you get back to it. How fabulous. Thanks for sharing that information, Megan. That was wonderful. When I was watching that, I was wondering what some of the challenges of designing these underwater creatures would be. Uh, we still got James. James, what can you tell us? When we're designing a character or creature for an underwater environment, the most obvious thing we need to consider is all that water. How would living in water shape the way a creature looks? Does it breathe water like a fish? Or does it need to come up for air like a turtle? If the creature is really big and really old, what will happen when it spends a lot of time underwater? Will it have coral or plants or other things growing on it? How does the weight of the water affect the way the creature moves? And depending on its size, how will moving in the water affect the other things around it? For example, our monumentals like the sea serpent, giant ray and nautilus are very large. They can move fast, but because of their size and the effort of moving through all that water, they need time and a lot of space to move around. And when they do get moving, the turbulence they create will affect any characters, creatures or vehicles nearby. Mm. Thinking about the huge creatures in the water is really interesting. I mean, I hadn't really thought about all the different ways that water could affect how these mythical sea creatures are designed. Mm. Yeah, and like you said at the start, Gary, when creating an animation, every single little thing that you see on screen was a decision made by the people who created the show. It's a lot of work. Totally worth it though, right? I mean, well, you know, hmm, I was hoping to find out just a little bit more maybe about one of my favorite creatures on the show that we haven't mentioned yet, um, a little thing called the Kraken. The Kraken, oh, that's one of the coolest creatures in the show. I actually think that we're quite close to where the Kraken lives. Let me see if I can get us close enough so we can see the Kraken through the window. Okay, but I mean, are you sure that that's... Um, yeah, it's safe, it's safe. safe. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Oh. Oh, oh, no. oh dear. My gosh, it's so big. It's so big. I can't even see the whole thing. Yeah, and look at those giant suction cups and the eye. Oh my goodness, the eye is huge. It's got to be so complicated to make these giant creatures. They're so big and there's so much detail that you can see. Okay, I think we can move a little bit further away now. Um, did you know whew, uh, that the Kraken, and just, you know, I've been doing some research, is based off a mythical sea monster from ye olde times. I wonder if it's more difficult to animate creatures rather than human characters. Oh, good question, Gary. Uh, let's ask Avril. Um, Avril, are creatures more complicated than humans to animate? Some creatures are more um, complicated than humans to animate. And um, an example of this in the deep would be the Kraken, a very popular character. Um, he's enormous, uh, an enormous mon monumental. So in the deep in season two, the Kraken was finally revealed. Um, it has a lot of tentacles, it's, um, you know, its scale is large. So we didn't want to build the entire Kraken. We didn't want to have to model an entire Kraken and we didn't want to have to animate the entire Kraken, which would have been 
time consuming with all those tentacles. So in season two, we actually only modeled a few tentacles and the eye of the Kraken, because it's the only thing you see in the story. So we only created and animated those individual components. So rather than making the entire thing, we focused on a few elements. By the time we got to season four, you know, the story had revealed more of the Kraken. So of course, then we had to focus on other elements. And in season four, we focused more on the head of the Kraken because that was re revealed. Um, and only those parts that were in the story did we create. But to give that sense of enormity, to give that feeling of enormity without actually having to create it and animate it, a lot of lighting was used and selective shots, which created shadows in the water and a sort of sense of mystery and foreboding and gave you a feeling that there was a huge creature there when you were only seeing small components of it. Or, you know, And that's kind of one of the ways we get round animating big complicated creatures because they are more complicated than humans if if they're um if they have a lot of elements to them so cool uh it's also really interesting to me that they didn't make concept art for the whole body of the kraken all because the audience wouldn't see the whole thing uh in season two and i think that really made the kraken far more mysterious and, and kind of scary as well uh, well, we've learned so much about how the team at The Deep have created these creatures. Bridget, is creating creatures something only the team at The Deep can do? No way. Anyone can create their own creature and we would love for you to have a go at designing your own creature for The Deep. First up, you need to do some research. We've made you a handy worksheet where you can research four different real underwater creatures and look into their behavioural, physical and survival characteristics. Then using all that information we want you to re that you've researched, we want you to merge them all together. Just as you've seen James and Avril talk about today, pick the parts of the animal you like the most and mash them all together. So you can also add fun things that you come up with your own, in your own imagination and all of your creative flair to design your own unique creature for the deep. Sounds great. You can also design habitat maybe. You could even write an episode for the series to feature your newly designed creature. Teachers, we'll send you all those uh, resources after the workshop today. And we want to see what you create. So please email us with your designs as well. Uh, before we finish up, actually, let's watch some students uh, share their des newly designed creatures as well. Great idea. Amazing, aren't those kids so extremely talented? Absolutely. Well, we've learned so much today. I know that I have. Um, a big thanks to James and Avril, uh, and also to Megan from the National Maritime Museum for sharing her ocean science expertise. Absolutely, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, hold on, Gary, before you go, there is something outside oh, right there. Look, now, look, quickly, ah. it's a Megalodon! <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, it looks like we lost power. I'll call the Neckens for backup. Oh, great idea. Yes. Well, if you're still there, thanks so much for joining from your classroom. I will get the lights back on here and have fun designing your own creatures for the deep. <laughs>